I shouldn't be here anymore. Echo 3 was looking out into the approaching storm. The heavy rain was beating down the decrepit, brutalist concrete of Frontera Una and coming their way toward Dos, their first stop. <sighs> Don't start that again. Jaron rolled his one good eye. He was done listening to the synth complain, even more done listening to them pontificate out loud. Well, at least you can afford the transfer into a new body. And what has that cost me? Three spoke with melancholy looking over their shoulder at Jaron. The cyborg popped out his right arm to remove all of the gunk gathered between the scavenge mechanisms that barely worked to begin with. The trek from their landing site to the city was brutal. There were things stuck inside the gears of his elbow that he would never be able to clean out. It squeaked a little as he checked the range of motion. His mechanical eye was staring at the synth, and his good one kept tracing the parts that needed mending on his arm. Keep your eye on the storm, Three. Any flybys? Quinn interrupted what would have become an argument. Three looked out again. The perimeter was clear from Harpiai. There was only rain. So much rain. They always came out after the downpour, when the acid had settled. One of the last surviving species on the exoplanet, the Harpiai were great winged creatures with certain freakish features, which enticed one of the early settlers to name them after mythological creatures from humanity's past. Almost all the other millions of lifeforms were wiped out even before Zeon bought out the frontier from Earth half a century previously. Not that he had any plans of conservation either. The item is currently located near Cuatro. It's moving constantly, and mostly on abandoned routes. He was reading a map that was synced with the item's tracker. There's surely rogues there. Quinn shook his head. I knew this job was going to be trouble. Why again did I let you convince me to take it, Jaron? Oh, uh, 6.5 million upon delivery, per capita. Right. <laughs> and you're too young for retirement. Jaron snickered. Young in synth years, practically a corpse in human. He wasn't planning to transfer into a synth. He wasn't saving for it. Quinn wanted to die on a beach somewhere back on Earth with the bones he was born with. He still believed it was practically a paradise if he could afford its few remaining pleasures. That was where his hard-earned coin was going. Thunder struck close to them. The dark, acidic clouds were approaching. Uh, the streets are already empty. We need to move inside the bunker. Jaron lit a cigarette and inhaled deeply. Oh, my father always said to do as the locals when there's gray in the horizon. He stood up and propped up his mechanical arm over his shoulder like an axe. Then again, he also said I'd do great things with my life. He added, puffing up his chest. We're perfectly safe here. Jaron and Quinn gaped at three. They didn't share their death wish. Quinn shot a glance at Jaron and motioned with his head toward the stairwell. This is a watchtower. They were built to withstand the showers. The synth was offended by the reaction they got. Even their artificial voice showed the hurt. Not to mention that the bunker here was practically dismantled when our patron took over the frontier. You two would have suffocated within the hour. Jaron plopped back down on his seat, smoke jets coming out of his nostrils as he held the cigarette with his teeth. <coughs> Boss? Yeah, this will do, Quinn said under his breath. He had little faith in Three's info since they had experienced a severe glitch during their last mind transfer from their second synth body. A lot of their memories were still mixed up and they didn't process complex new data safely. But risking the bunker didn't feel right either. This one will suffocate right here. Artificial lungs are hard to come by these days, I've heard. I got plans in motion. Jaron narrowed his eyes. <laughs> You don't need to worry about me, old-timer. Those great things aren't out of reach yet, huh? 
Jaron spat out the bud of his cigarette and quickly lit a new one, squeezing it with his teeth again. Let's just say I don't have to worry about my health anymore or changing my oil once it's standard. Fool. Three muttered. They stayed at the top of the watchtower for hours, half a standard frontier day. The item was moving away from them and ahead of the downpours. The longer they waited, the harder it was getting to catch up. Night had come and settled around their hiding place. The only illumination in the three bundled cities around them was short and sudden from the lightning in the storm. Quinn was restless, Jaron was mostly sleeping, and Three was scanning the horizon constantly. What Quinn's maps didn't show of the surrounding area, the synth's eyes caught without problem even in the dark. Earth spared no expense for the planet when it built the first cities. Frontera Esperanza was its first name, though it always felt more like a title for the program that humanity set for itself centuries ago. It did that for all the frontier exoplanets, with stable wormholes leading to them. Colossal buildings scraped the sky, reaching further than they should, reaching for greatness. Cultural centers, museums, theaters, you name it, Earth built it for the miners and their families that were to populate the idyllic world, which had become a desolate hell over time. Once all resources were drained, all life crushed, and all hope extinguished. The planet was sold to the lowest bidder. Zeon, the man who made his fortunes on the precious minerals this particular frontier was offering, wanted it for himself. There's no better conversation starter during a gala in your honor than owning a planet, even if you live it to rot in reality. The downpours had almost completely melted and corroded most of the architecture what was once meant to inspire all, to impose the power of an intergalactic humanity of its denizens, presently only inspired dread or sadness in others, anger in just a few. Echo 3 felt all of it as they were gazing down at Dos and out at the very end of the city where it met Una with a swamp of acid. Partially melted monuments still peeked out from the liquid that was dissolving them slowly. Has it moved? Three spoke between strikes of thunder. The storm was just above them, hitting the tower mercilessly. Not in a quarter of a standard. It stopped somewhere near Cinco, off the main route. The place isn't logged in the maps. Maybe an old bunker? An independent settlement in the high cliffs? I can't tell for sure, but I think it was never a city. Quinn was searching through the satellite images from the Terran but they were at least 20 years old, possibly more, since Zeon didn't appreciate anyone picking at his property. He, like a lot of the oligarchs in possession of frontier exoplanets, decided not to share their feed with anyone else. The only thing Zeon shared with Quinn was a passcode for the item's tracker. The location is very close to the port though, Quinn added after a moment. His tone deepened. I don't like it. We might lose the item. <laughs> Don't be such a pessimist. Jaron yawned, then added. We can catch you on the Frontera Magna. We don't have passes for jumping frontiers, let alone Magna. Three sneered at him. You need a pass for that? Wasn't it still Earth? Frontera Zyra since Mars fell. Have you been there recently? Quinn shivered. No, we grab it here. He didn't want Three and Jaron digging into the subject much more, because there was one little thing he neglected to mention before they left for Frontera Zion. Namely, they only had one-way passes through the wormhole, granted by their patron. If they didn't have the item upon return, they would never have been allowed through the fold in space-time again. Quinn could forget about dipping his toes in the ocean. They would be stuck on the devastated, lawless exoplanet until either acid melted their skin, organic or otherwise, or the rogues peeled it off of them. Either type was good money on the intergalactic black market. When the downpour stopped and the wait for the acid to settle into concrete and ground began, 
they came up with a plan. Jaron and Quinn would set off between the locals to find additional weapons and any kind of transport, since using their ship was out of the question in the present atmospheric conditions. Three would remain in the tower to track the item's movement because the locals weren't too keen on seeing synths on their planets. Most of the time, they were sent as surrogate emissaries of wealthy earthlings that didn't want their feet touching the spoiled grounds of their frontiers. Usually, they were there for business, but sometimes, they were also there for pleasure. Pleasure that was all theirs, and just as sadistic as their business ventures. Among the simpler colonists, the mere sight of a synth was regarded as a bad omen. Among the rogues, as coin, and not just for the sophisticated skin wrapped around their artificial frames. Echo 3 might have welcomed their long-awaited death after almost 300 years of being alive, but entrapment by those brutes was worse than their current predicament. Quinn kept looking over his shoulder when he entered the marketplace deep inside the concrete building that was once Frontera Esperanza's assembly. It looked more like a witch market than anything else. The soaring columns held up a spherical ceiling with murals depicting how blissful life used to be on the frontier. The look down at eye level showed exactly what life had become at a single glance. Everything and everyone felt broken, dirty, hopeless. People were huddled together in a tight spot, breathing down each other's necks, fighting over or haggling for precious resources such as food and water. As hard as he tried to blend in between the locals, he stood out like a sore thumb. Should anyone want to follow him, they wouldn't have any issues doing so, and he certainly was being followed by several different groups that operated in the area. If he was lucky, they would have killed each other for the right to grab him before actually grabbing him. Quinn pulled his hood over his head, feeling like his breathing mask wasn't enough to cover his outsider appearance. He pushed between the people in the market. All of a sudden, he heard a harpia shriek nearby. His blood froze. His knees buckled. However, none of the locals reacted to the chilling sound. Business as usual for them. Quinn tried keeping calm by staying in place and peeking around unnoticeably until he located the beast. At first glance and from the back, it looked like an extraordinarily tall and burly human being, draped in one of those bulky robes that the frontiers people used when crossing the vast gorges and wastelands of Frontera Zion. Dark, feathery, and filthy. The harpia shrieked again making Quinn's hair stand on end. Then it turned and looked right at him as it shook off the dust of its mighty wings. That was when Quinn discovered why no one was worried about its presence. It was chained by the feet, and its mighty wings were bound. So was its stare. The creature was just as broken as the people around it, drugged until it became a docile bird, its spirit defeated shivering between the concrete walls and the slabs of unidentified meat hanging from metal hooks. It was expensive, too. Quinn heard his auctioneer spit out unbelievable sums to two willing patrons. One was an off-worlder, a synth surrounded only by its guards that were armed to the teeth. They stuck out the crowd more than Quinn did. The other didn't look like he could afford to bet. Probably a shill. The daunting bird was still looking at Quinn, observing him as if it were seeing something for the first time. It either wondered how he tasted, or it was asking for help. Quinn couldn't tell, nor did he care, or could he stand looking at the miserable face that was one of the most alarming things one could see in the sky, circling and screeching before swooping down. Usually, it was the last thing people would see before they would perish between talons and teeth. This one somehow looked more sinister. Its beastly face that mimicked a human one confirmed its mythological namesake. The auction was suddenly over, and it now belonged to the synth, standing in for who knows who back on Earth that would make its life an even greater hell. 
It squeaked as its new owner pulled on his chains and Quinn finally looked away. You would have hated the market. He addressed three when they came down and met him at the base of the watchtower. He told them all about the synth that was there, but not about how he saw it being dragged away in the shadows and its guards brutally murdered. On a positive note, at least Quinn got to buy out their weapons for cheap by the looters that quickly swiped them from the massacred bodies. The Harpia was back at the auctioneer's stand where he saw her first before he even left the market. Better than watching the locals getting snatched by those flying beasts for a chunk of a standard. Do they ever learn? Three was unusually pissy. It wasn't like them to hate on people. I've told them many times. Three, you've never been here before. Quinn said softly. He noticed their mind was drifting between memories again. Oh, yes, never. Should he even ask about the item, he wondered but was interrupted before he could do or say anything more. Tank. What? Queen panicked and then realized Three was pointing at something before he felt the tremble of a massive vehicle moving behind him. Guess that must be Jaron. Who else would be this tacky? Three was smiling, but their tightly glued lips never showed teeth. It was a bit uncanny until one got used to it. This must be his idea of inconspicuous. As crazy as riding along in a tank would be, and all the attention it would attract, it was actually a good idea. The terrain that would lead them to their destination where the item had remained was awfully rugged. Bonus points if it had a working cannon. B before you say anything... Jadon spoke as the automated door was opening. This was the best I could do. Good job. Uh, good. Quinn and Three quickly entered the vehicle mounting all their stuff inside and left Jaron scratching his head. He had already smoked up the compartment inside something nasty. Quinn's eyes immediately started watering. And who's this? Three noticed a fourth passenger in the tank. Gratis. Comes with a large purchase like this one. They told me it knows the way. Jaron replied. Quinn was horrified. This planet was worse than what he originally thought when he agreed to do the job. His stomach churned, and he tried picturing a lovely beach back on Earth to ease his mind. It didn't help, naturally. Uh, but they usually call them that. Jaron added after finally starting the engine back up again. He squeezed his eyebrows tightly, realizing that the small issue now might become a large problem later. Three paused and eyed Jaron sideways. Pop. Sounds better. They smiled at the child guide, but freaked her out. She recoiled and tried shoving herself into the back corner of the vehicle, where Quinn was arranging their new plasma rifles. The pup hid behind him and hugged him tightly. Oh, Quinn. She likes you. Three gushed despite the reaction they got from the pup. But doesn't she speak, Jaron? They asked. Neither he nor the guide replied. If she could speak... She didn't want to, and if she knew the way towards the cliffs at all, she wasn't too interested to guide the group of strangers there. Quinn eventually managed to get himself out of her grip and opened the maps by the time they left the city, guiding Jaron as best as he could through the wasteland. Their newly obtained vehicle might have withstood the ground soaked in acid from the previous downpours and all the worn and torn parts of what used to be roads back in the day but it wasn't built for speed. As they were approaching the halfway mark toward their destination, three alerted Quinn of the incoming storm. They were far enough not to be affected by the rain yet, but they needed to find some kind of shelter soon if they would survive the acid blitz. Quinn looked through the maps and found a spot that was marked as a historical location. The satellite images showed only ruins there. The next bundle of cities was even further away from them than the item was. Does this still exist? He tapped at the screen with the map. Is this somewhere we can hide? He asked the guide. She glanced at the tablet and looked bewildered by the sight. She must have never seen a map in her life, Quinn thought. Jadon cursed to the high heavens. Gratis, because she's worth no damn thing! He shouted from the driver's side. Stop that! 
Quinn snarled back at Jaron. He paused to think, and he felt the girl's eyes on him. For some reason, she saw him as her protector, and he could feel it. He didn't like that. He didn't like that at all. Quinn was already responsible for three, and he couldn't bear the weight of another burden. Simultaneously, Three was looking out into the distance of the flats surrounding them in all directions. They still couldn't see any glimpses of the ruins Quinn mentioned. The tank was exposed to everything the planet could throw at them there. Suddenly, they perched higher on their seat and looked as far behind as they could. The clouds created by the acid downpours hitting the dusty bedrock behind them blurred their vision. For a moment, they thought they saw few vehicles racing in front of the storm. And above them, soaring high, were a pair of wings that glistened in the lightning like they were made out of metal. Two red eyes glared from inside the cloud. Three would have said something to the rest, but for a moment, they dropped out of time again and thought they were back at Frontera Galatea, where the rain was sweet and gentle 200 years ago. Let her see. Quinn told Three, who was seated up in the cupola. The optical periscope is useless. The synth had to fully retreat and squeeze back as much as they could for the girl to even move one step closer. Quinn helped her up and sat below the hatch. Do you recognize anything? Can you point us there? He tried talking to the girl to no avail. Then, he noticed that she was shaking, so he pulled her back into the tank. What is it? What do you see? Three pushed them aside and got to the cupola again. There was nothing new in the horizon in each direction. However, their guide was pale as a ghost. She was shaking her head with eyes wide open and glaring at Quinn. He tried asking her all kinds of questions, but didn't get a response. It was obvious that she had recognized where they were headed though. Even more obvious that she didn't want to go there at all. She was terrified. I see something. Three bent halfway in after a few moments. Jaron, adjust our course 45 degrees to the east. The ruins are in the middle of the flats. A few structures are still visible, so we might be lucky to find shelter. We should arrive in a quarter of a standard. Quinn found himself in a tight spot. Between the girl's reaction and Three's diminished capabilities, he realized that they could potentially be heading into very dangerous territory. The fact that the only thing he could do was wait until they arrived there made him anxious. The time needed to get to the ruins, Quinn had spent trying to find a way to communicate with their guide. He didn't get anything out of her that would suggest what was waiting for them in their midway stop, apart from the head shakes and odd hand gestures that he barely understood. From a kilometer away, the abandoned city looked like a mirage floating on top of the gray and beige soil. The buildings that were still standing had turned the darkest gray almost black. Quinn was sat in the cupola with his hands on the cannon, ready to test it out if needed. He didn't want three up there, even if their eyes were much more suited to scan the site for any danger lurking between the decaying slabs of concrete and metal. There weren't any harpiai circling above, so Quinn presumed that they should be relatively safe. But as they were slowly rolling closer, he could hear them. A shriek here, a screech there. He couldn't pinpoint where the sound was coming from or how many of them were nestled inside the ruins. The tank stopped abruptly in front of a decrepit wall that wasn't much taller than its wheels. Quinn heard Jadon cursing, then they began moving in reverse. This was the moment when the shrill call of the harpia became much clearer and he knew exactly where it was coming from. In one swift motion, Quinn rotated the cannon and looked through the scope. Not far behind them, not too high in the darkened sky either, a single massive harpia was sliding through the air toward them. It roared and flashed a metallic set of teeth as lightning was raging behind her between the heavy clouds. Beneath the soaring beastly bird, Quinn saw two trucks headed in their direction. It was either him that they had followed from the market or Jaron. 
Quinn didn't think twice before pulling the trigger of the cannon once one of the trucks rode into range. One blast at its front wheels and it flipped in the air, landing topside down. The harpia shrieked again and sped up, following the cues from the second rogue truck that didn't stop racing toward the tank. Unfortunately, one blast was also enough to render the cannon useless. By the time Quinn squeezed back into the main compartment, Jaron was yelling, puffing up smoke, and sweating as he navigated the tank away from the short wall through a small breach between the concrete. Grab the steering! He told Quinn and immediately let go, jumping toward the back of the tank. He pushed the girl aside with one swipe of his mechanical arm and grabbed a plasma rifle. Three opened the cupola for him, and in a second, he was out there blasting at the harpia and the second truck with everything he got. Uh, it's a cyborg! He yelled. Uh, the damn creature's a cyborg! The rogues were in opening fire on the tank. They must have been expecting their pet to corner it so they could get the coveted loot. Quinn's skin and organs, his flesh for the market, their weapons, and possibly the synth they caught at a glance on top of the cupola during the long trek in the flats. Unless they knew what the trio was after and they needed them alive long enough to obtain the passcode to the tracker. Many on ground were aware that the item was on the planet and what it was worth to Zeon. I must have seen them before and forgot to tell you. Quinn, I'm so sorry. Three stuttered. Stop and focus. Tell me what you saw of the city. Where should we shelter? The downpour is just behind them. Where's soup if they don't get to us first? Think hard. Quinn needed three at the top of their game, not spiraling into shame for their condition since that just made it worse. It wasn't their fault anyway. It was Quinn's, the way he saw it. Second truck is down! Jadon shouted, interrupting what three was going to say. But the blasted harpy is still on us! Move it, Quinn! It's taking my hits like a champ! The tank couldn't go much faster, not only because of its make, but because the state of the terrain inside the abandoned city was worse than the wastelands. Quinn was navigating the huge vehicle around fallen columns, walls, and through acid downpours that were caught in basins of decayed roads. Meanwhile, Jaron was already losing the battle. With barely any ammo left, he had to pick and choose when and where to fire at the airborne beast. Most of the time, he missed because the visibility was dropping significantly as the skies above them were darkening. The lightning only made it worse for either one of the cyborg's eyes. On the northern side of the city, I saw a high rise. It was the only one noticeable in the skyline from a few kilometers back. That must be the old city's watchtower since it's still standing against the rains. Three finally came up with an answer for Quinn. Are you sure you're not just remembering the skyline of Dos? 50% sure. Three said frankly. That'll have to do. Quinn gripped the steering. However, just before he was able to change their course, oh, Jaron screamed oh. out in pain. And a few seconds later, the harpia dropped him right in front of the tank. Quinn made a full stop in a second, flat. He and three were shocked for a moment looking out at the devastating sight. The harpia, the size of two Jadons put together, with a wingspan long enough to encompass the entire tank, swooped down and landed in front of them. To make matters worse, thunder stroked close, and the first drops of acid began falling. Her wings opened and shielded both herself and Jaron while she dealt strike after strike with her sharp talons at him. The cyborg caught some of her strikes with his mechanical arm and blasted her with a plasma rifle with his other one at every opportunity, but he was no match for her. She was merciless. Eventually, his mechanical arm gave out. The harpia grabbed and squeezed it, ripping Janon's arm straight out of its socket. It was broken to pieces, even before it hit the ground. In a final attempt to save himself, Jaron aimed his rifle at the Harpia's face. She flashed her metallic teeth at him and dove closer for a bite. Jaron fired on instinct. That was the first blast she couldn't dodge in a while. Hardly injured, but greatly stunned from the shot, the beast fell back and landed off the left side of the tank. 
The cyborg was suddenly left without the cover from the rain. It wasn't pouring yet, but the droplets of acid that managed to get through the ruins they were under had already scarred him forever. Jaron! Quinn called out to him from the cupola. He had another plasma rifle ready. Catch! The weapon that Quinn threw at Jaron dropped just by his feet. He leaped, barely catching himself up, grabbed the rifle from the ground, and started shooting at the harpia like a madman. He shot at her mechanical wings until there was almost nothing left of them. She was howling and screaming, trying to get away or swiping at Jaron with her talons. But all of her efforts were rendered useless by his savagery. Her miserable face finally showed fear and defeat. This wasn't the first time someone had fired at her wings, demolishing them without any remorse. The tables had turned, and there was no mistake who the beast was at the moment. Almost all of Jaron's skin was burned off his shoulders and scalp from the acid, but he couldn't stop shooting until Quinn found a way to go out under a cover and drag him back to the tank. When they finally settled inside, Three and the pup were looking at Jaron in horror. The harpia was still wailing. She was still alive. <laughs> a mechanical arm for a set of mechanical wings. <laughs> That's what I call justice. Jaron said in response to their stare. Three looked away from him in disgust and through the small window at the beast that was being scorched by the acid. She'll never fly again. They lamented. She won't live to fly. Jaron wasn't even merciful enough to kill her. Harpiai never left their victims squirming in dread, half dead. Once they had a firm grip, they dealt a swift and clean death. Quinn dropped back down in the driver's seat and kept silent. He knew what Jaron was like. That was why he brought him. That was why he always worked with him. He dared not look at three who at that point was already tending to the cyborg's burns. But as expressive as their artificial face was, it couldn't show the intensity of their scorn for Jaron. Three really shouldn't have been there. Before the downpour hit the ruins in full swing, Quinn and the rest were unloading all their gear and supplies inside the abandoned watchtower. They hid the tank as best as they could from the rain, but all of them knew it would have been a miracle if it survived the pour. It would have been a miracle if the four of them survived the infernal rain as well. They remained at the lowest level of the tower, just to be on the safe side. The first hour, Three and Quinn had spent patching up Jaron and tending to the pup. Once he was out cold from the drugs they pumped in him, the girl fed and given a few sedatives to calm her. It was finally time to take a look at the tracker and check if they went through all of that for nothing. Surprisingly, the item was still at the same location it had been since they left Dos. It hadn't moved. Not even a few meters. This should have been good news, but instead, Quinn was alarmed by the situation. He felt a sudden tightness in his chest as he saw the tracker blinking in the same spot it had been. Two standards the item remained in place when previously it was speeding toward the port city. You look worried. Three said as they joined him at the far end of the level, away from the cyborg and the pup. I... I don't know if Jaron will survive. Quinn said gloomily. I've seen him lose an arm and a leg, but those burns are terrible. He's strong. Quinn looked into Three's eyes and wondered if he was as strong as Jaron. If he would ever get a life that wasn't a constant race to find someone or something. Earth suddenly felt incredibly far away. It felt unreachable. <sighs> if you can save the body, save the mind, Quinn muttered. He was thinking about the second thing that worried him. He feared their item had already been decommissioned, as it were. That the mind of Zeon's daughter was being held hostage by a group of rogues that got to her before they could, and her synthetic body was already stripped for parts and sold. With Jaron in his current state, three the way they always were, and a defenseless child, he stood little chance of extracting the item from its captors, little chance of being granted passage through the wormhole, of seeing Earth again, and going to a luxe resort to rest 
to enjoy life for once and eventually die in peace. Of course he did. Send three. She was one of the first that deleted their backups. This version is the only one he has of her. I should have done it earlier. Three. You did what you thought was right at the time and brought me back without knowing my wishes. But I've done it now. This is the only me in existence. The way it was when I was human a long time ago. Not that I remember those times all that well. They grin in the awkward synth way. Quinn could tell that Three had a lot of respect for Zeon's daughter by the way they continued rambling on about her. He had heard the stories about her too, what she did and how she kept defying her father, others like him, Earth even. But he never gave those stories a second thought. Then again, he wasn't a synth, nor was he from the frontier planets. The woman was a living legend if one would believe what was said. Her remarkable fight against other oligarchs and the wretched treatment of the frontier planets constantly made headlines across the intergalactic news cycle. She was wanted in the entirety of Earth's commonwealth, with the bounty on her head as high as 50 million on some frontiers. Thankfully, there weren't any bounty hunters on Frontera Zion according to Quinn's sources, apart from him and his team. The rogues were easier to deal with. They didn't know how much her mind really cost. The conversation between the two trailed off naturally. When Three noticed that Quinn was falling first into his own thoughts, then slowly asleep, they remained standing watch of the tower and made sure that the organics in their care were resting nicely. They needed the rest if they could make it to the item, especially Jaron. During the night between the bouts of pouring rain and cracks of thunder, Three heard many strange things that they couldn't explain, but they wondered. They doubted their judgment on what those sounds could be. None of them sounded like they could have come from rogues that might have survived the fight with Quinn and Jaron, or Harpiai that were lingering among the ruins, hiding where they could. Or maybe they were. Every once in a while, Three would peek at the girl who was asleep and dreaming. All the undefinable sounds from the ruins seemed to seep into her sleep, making her twitch and turn and roll around like she hadn't been sedated. The next morning didn't start great. Jaron woke up in pain, screaming from the top of his lungs, cursing everything under the Zionian sky. Three had to dose him again and again until he calmed a little and could function somewhat independently. The pup got a little dose as well, just so that she wouldn't sprint out of the watchtower and disappear on them into the wastelands. And Quinn, he was wound up tighter than the Harpia's backside. He and Three had checked the tank as soon as they were able to. It was bad. The starting issue had come back just as Jaron feared it would. The lack of appropriate cover during the downpour overnight had finished it completely. They were stuck in the middle of the flats without any idea how to get to the item they were after. We can't carry him all the way there. Quinn spoke quietly with Three. We'd already be exposing ourselves to the storm. I, I can hear you. Not quietly enough. Nobody's going to carry me anywhere. I don't walk with my hands, do I? Jaron snarled at Quinn and Three. I won't be staying here to rot my barely organic ass either. I need to get myself alive as I came back to Earth and get a synth echo for myself. Then all this pain will be gone. We weren't just going to leave you here. Three responded indignantly. Jaron scoffed. He trusted Quinn since he had saved his life twice already, but he didn't trust the planet they were on, even less the ruins. Much like Three, he had heard strange noises in the night while he was drifting in and out of consciousness. Something told him that it wasn't the massive pain he was in. The difference between him and a synth was that he rarely doubted the faculties of his mind. There might not have been a lot of complexity to it, but it was a strong mind, as strong as his body. <sighs> Fine, we're all going, but I don't want to hear you complain when the sun hits your burns. 
Quinn settled the argument. Then he turned to the girl. I think it's time for you to start pulling your weight. We've fed you, sheltered you, protected you, and we'll need something in return. She gaped at him and started backing up toward the door. <sighs> you can't outrun plasma, my- Jadon gripped the rifle with his good arm. He hadn't put it down once he grabbed it from the ground during his fight with the Harpia. The girl froze in horror. No, no. Three intervened. He won't shoot you, Pop. Jaron raised an eyebrow. Look, we just need you to guide us, like you were supposed to do. Quinn added. I can tell you know this place. You can't lie to me and pretend you don't understand. All you need to do is point us in the right direction and show us the quickest way out of the flatlands to the cliffs. She wavered. They all saw it. There was no place else to go anyway. The pup needed to find shelter as well for when the storms returned, and they all knew she wouldn't want to stay in the abandoned city for another quarter standard, let alone for another night. She took a step toward Quinn and pointed to his tablet. He took the hint and quickly opened the satellite images. The girl shook her head. She wanted to see the map again. So you do know how to read those, huh? The item's tracker was blinking in the same spot. The girl traced a route from their current location to the cliffs. That's surely not the quickest way. Quinn commented, peering at the map. Are those the dangerous points you're telling me to avoid? She nodded. Will you take us? Quinn asked her. She took his hand and nodded again. Thank you, pup. Quinn felt relieved. That was the single good thing that had happened since he woke up. He felt that Earth wasn't so unreachable anymore. As they were moving away from the ruins, three looked back. It once again seemed like the abandoned city was floating on top of the flatland soil. They never got a chance to share what they noticed while the rest were sleeping that night. Never spoke about it with Jaron, who had heard it too. The four of them were lucky that what made those odd sounds never manifested itself in the watchtower. For what was truly hiding in those ruins wasn't like anything they had encountered before. It was what the pup was truly afraid of, and the reason why the city was abandoned even before the atmosphere of the frontier was destroyed. It was something that had existed on the planet for eons and was more unwelcoming to off-worlders than the Harpiai. The girl rushed to the front of the group and led them toward the cliffs. Quinn was tensed because he couldn't see an elevation, a mountain ridge, a hill, anything that he expected to see by then, as the maps indicated. Only later he would understand that he had read them wrong. A first. This planet had thrown many surprises at him, and it wasn't done yet. Jaron was lagging behind. He had exceeded his threshold of pain a few kilometers back. The sun was as rough as the rains. Quinn already had blisters on the exposed parts of his skin, and so did the girl. Jaron didn't have any dressing or any kind of cover on his wounds from the acid, so it felt like he was being burned all over again. The drugs didn't help anymore, but he didn't stop. A tank himself, he could go on until his feet would have worn off. His only comfort was the cigarette he kept holding in his teeth, puffing up smoke more than inhaling it. All of a sudden, the girl took off running and in a few moments, she disappeared from view completely. Jaron was already cursing from the back, three speeding after her, followed by Quinn who couldn't run as fast. Stop! Pop! Wait! Don't you leave us here, mate! Three had to brace herself before they would fall off the cliffs that they so eagerly needed to find. They also had to grab Quinn unless he would fall from the sharp edge and tumble down into a giant lake of acid. The flatlands ended with the cliffs. They had been on the elevation all along. Quinn had interpreted the map so badly that he almost became the liability in their group, a place that three usually held. He was getting too old for the job. He really needed to retire and rest his mind. The pup had slipped through a crack in the cliffs and was waiting for them on a narrow passageway just below the edge. When Quinn looked down, she pointed to the other side of the lake as if to say, there. He and Three stared at the point she was showing. I can see it. Three said and looked through the map. 
the lake through you for a loop. They smirked. But this non-standardized map is a little tricky, even for an old pro like you. <sighs> did, did you find it? Jaron finally caught up with them. He was panting, yet he still gripped the smoke with his teeth. It's a settlement. Was, I should say. The people must have tried building in the rock to protect themselves from the downpours when they began. But the formation of this lake must have driven them away. Three explained. I've seen places like these on Galatea before. They stopped. Wait. I see some shadows moving around the opening in the rock. Harpii are circling the entrance. It's gotta be a den. Oh, we're fucking doomed. And who's the pessimist now? Quinn returned at Jadon's remark. However, when he rotated back to look at him and gloat, he had to agree. Jadon was doomed. He was a walking, sweating, smoking corpse, disintegrating before his very eyes. Slowly, but surely, Quinn needed to get him back to their ship as fast as possible and freeze him in cryo so he could preserve Jadon's brain for the transfer he coveted. Though they needed to get his coin first, they were going into the den to collect Zeon's daughter, no matter what. Even if the Harpii had destroyed her body, her mind surely must have been preserved or the tracker would have shut down. <sighs> what was she even doing here? Jaron huffed and puffed as he was navigating the narrow passageway, with Quinn in front of him to show his step in the steep parts and three to hold him from the back. He was on the verge of collapse. Quinn suspected that one of two things had happened to Zeon's daughter. Either she went inside the den willingly since the conservation of wildlife was one of her passions, or she was taken there by someone. Someone human. The Harpia never attacked since, unless they were threatened. The idea that she was being held by rogues inside the den didn't seem like an impossibility. After he saw how they were able to control the Harpia at the market, and the one that was chasing them through the wastelands and into the abandoned city. He was worried that the situation there wasn't as simple as he thought at the time. He was also worried that he might have missed some important clues along the way. Quinn began to understand how three must have been feeling since they met in Galatea, and he thought that he was saving them. Instead, he ended up ruining their mind in a black market transfer that corrupted their backup even before it was placed inside the synthetic body. How much longer, might? Jaron growled at the girl that was leading them, less afraid of the airborne beasts that she was of whatever lurked in the abandoned city behind them. They were two-thirds of the way there and had to become much more careful so that they weren't seen by the Harpii that were guarding the den. The sky was beginning to darken and there was distant thunder. The group was running short on time, and there was even less opportunity to hide from the downpours on the passageway, tracing through the barren cliffs, than there was to hide from the Harpia's eyes. After a short while, she stopped. There was a lean fissure in the rock next to them. Quinn and the rest realized that they were supposed to huddle up there and make a run for the den as soon as the first droplets of the rain arrive and the Harpii all retreated inside their home. They were furious with the girl for not alerting them of the danger, but they had no choice. They had to hide where they were told. None of the three bounty hunters liked being placed in a position where there wasn't a secondary exit strategy, much more in a position with even fewer security backups than what they were used to. Quinn tried again and failed to communicate with the pup anything that she might know about the den itself. They were going in blind, and three was entering first. The sky went dark, flashes of lightning reflected in the acid, and each thunderstrike echoed between the cliffs. The Harpii slowly began retreating. It was go time. The only cover that they could spare went to the girl regardless of Jaron's protest. He was given simply a piece of rubber from the grip of a plasma rifle to bite into so that he wouldn't scream and alert the beasts when the acid scorched him again. He was getting a new and improved body soon anyway. The pup had only one. 
In the cover of darkness, the four of them ran toward the den and stopped just by the entrance. There was a small cover where Quinn, Jaron, and the girl could hide until the rain intensified while three scoped out the situation inside. The cyborg was barely standing, and Quinn didn't look too good either. He wished he had something to bite into as well, because his jaw was clenched so tight, suppressing a scream that he felt would break all of his teeth. The pup was holding his hand again. Three walked inside and scanned the den. Almost all of the harpii were already sleeping, glued to the rocky walls like the bats on earth used to sleep. There were hundreds of them in the first block of the den, and who knows how many were deeper inside where the settlement was before it was abandoned by the people that built it. They could see concrete structures with designs like those they had seen in the cities of Frontera Zion. All of them were in much better shape than their exposed cousins in the cities. The Harpii had the second best place on the frontier, luxurious compared to the conditions in which the humans had been living for a long time. Three peeked at the map with a signal from the tracker, realizing that the item, Zion's daughter, was just beyond the primary section of the den. Before going back out to get Quinn and the others, they looked for a safe hiding spot where they could stay during the downpour. The best one they could find was closer to the second block where the item was. It was relatively far from the single entrance and exit of the den that they knew about. On the other hand, it was risky, but still a better option than being melted down by acid. None of the four spoke, even before they walked inside together in a line with three, guiding them through the den since they were the only one that could see. They moved slowly and quietly. Everything that they had on them, apart from the rifles, the group had left on the ledge of the cliff before they even climbed down to the passageway and a few remaining trinkets they abandoned by the entrance. Even Jaron, in all of his anguish, was the quietest he had ever been in his life. He knew he wouldn't survive under their fight with a harpia, whether it was a cyborg like him or not. Quinn felt the darkness of the den like an intense pressure on his eyes. Feeling helpless wasn't something he was used to or enjoyed. Every single shuffle of feathers, rustling of wings, and scratch of a talon inside the block made him tense up and the roar of the thunder outside that echoed between the rock shot a chill down his spine. The only thing keeping him grounded was the squeeze of the little hand in his. When they arrived at the spot where they would hide, three whispered in his ear, Whatever you do, don't move without me. Then they walked away and vanished completely out of Quinn's perception. Three didn't tell them that their hiding spot was surrounded by Harpii, with just a small passage that would lead them there. One small wrong move, and they would all have been dead in a heartbeat. Quinn could hear Jaron shaking and groaning a little. He had a terrible fever and could barely hold it together any longer. The exoplanet broke the man that was as strong and lethal as a tank. The girl was squeezing his hand so tight that he had barely any feeling left in it, and his wounds burned like hell. Panic began tingling in his feet. A stream of cold sweat was running down his neck and back. He was suddenly hit with the thought that three might forget they were there, that they might forget where they themselves were. The few minutes while they were away were pure torment. Quinn never was so reliant on three. There had always been a second option, an escape. Someone sat next to him out of nowhere. Three was back, and Quinn just had to ask them, Did you find the item? Quinn whispered so silently that even Three had trouble hearing his question. Yes. He couldn't see if there was a second synth seated next to Three, but he could extrapolate that the only thing left was the daughter's mind, an entire consciousness saved on a sliver of plastic. Give it to me. There was no response, and Quinn began feeling a little angry as the little control he had slipped away even further. His anger took away the edge from the pain he felt as his adrenaline was rising. 
He was ready to crack, but he never got the chance. The den was suddenly filled with the loudest, most deafening, nerve-shattering harpia scream he had ever heard. Two red eyes appeared at the entrance, and they were almost immediately followed by intense flashlights coming from the outside. The lights were illuminating the demolished shape of the cyborg harpia who had survived her plight in the abandoned city. She was howling at her flock, waking each and every beast that had been dormant in the entire settlement. The silence was replaced by hundreds of screeching harpia getting rattled by the cyborg which, in turn, was controlled by the rogues. Several men covered in special protective gear appeared behind her. They were not ordinary rogues. Those suits costed an absolute fortune. One of them was holding some of the things that Quinn and the rest had left behind on their way to the den. Rookie mistake. Quinn would have never allowed himself such an omission before. He peeked at Jaron and saw abject horror on his face. The rogues knew they were there. The Harpia knew Jaron was there. They were done for. The Harpia called out a special shriek and a solitary beast flew down from the rocks and walked toward her. They touched forehead to forehead, their abominable faces showing warmth and love that not even the girl had seen before. It was the cyborg's mate. She screeched and cried out as if she was explaining something to him, to all of them. She moved what little had remained of her mechanical wings and wailed pathetically. Her wail echoed and was repeated by some of the harpiai. One of the rogues approached the two and showed a piece of blooded cloth to the harpia's mate. He sniffed it, gagged, then sniffed the air, and in a second had located Jaron. He looked directly at him, even though he was still seated in the darkness of their hiding spot. Jaron was snatched out of his seat even before he could cry out for help. Quinn froze as the calls of the harpia became so loud and dizzying that he couldn't even hear his thoughts anymore. They were all preparing for a feast, screeching and cackling in an attempt to drive even more fear into their victims. The Harpii were angry, and they would not be dealing with Quinn and the girl the way they would with their prey ordinarily. He could feel the pup tugging at his arm and trying to get his attention, but he couldn't even breathe. The only thing he noticed was three kneeling before him and her. They told the girl something that he couldn't hear and placed the item in her hand, then leaned closer to him. She will know a way out. She's resourceful. Follow her to the other side of this cliff and run until you can't run anymore. Three stood up with a plasma rifle in their arms. One weapon was in salvation. It was only a diversion. Three. Queen barely spoke. Please, don't. Don't do this. We can run together. We might still have a chance. Three grinned. I don't need another chance. I've had plenty of them. Go. Save her. The girl stood up slowly, and he followed her cue, coming to his senses a little. The harpii were ready to attack. There was barely any more time. Three turned away from them and immediately began shooting at the cyborg harpia. That surely got the flock's attention, their singular and undivided attention. No amount of control that the rogues had over the harpii could stop them from destroying the synth, rendering its body useless on the market. Quinn and the pup were already running in the opposite direction of the exit, deeper inside the settlement. They ran and ran until there was only darkness and the cold touch of rock against their skin. The girl had found another fissure that was either going to get them to the other side of the cliff or become their final resting place, their burial chamber. After a long time slithering between narrow walls, almost losing hope that they would ever get out, Quinn finally felt a warm breeze on his face. The two followed it and found themselves released from the grip of the gray rocks on the other side of the cliff. The sun was shining brightly, casting light upon another part of the wastelands of Frontera Zion. The storms had passed. They immediately set off on foot on the long journey toward the port city of Zionia. There was no point returning to his ship since it was docked far beyond the flatlands, beyond the first bundle of cities where the old port was located near Una. 
It took them a few standards to arrive there, hiding from the downpours in caves or deserted mines. They were starved and parched when they reached Zionia and didn't have any extra coin to quench their thirst or buy any kind of meat that open markets were selling. The port city was the only one that was actually being maintained and rebuilt after the downpours and thriving as much as a city on a decaying exoplanet could thrive. It held Zion's summer palace. It had to look rich and clean. Quinn was astonished to realize that the girl had never been there before, never seen the place. The only thing she had ever known were ruin and devastation. She was probably familiar with the wastelands, like she was with the back of her hand, even if she didn't want to share that with Quinn in the beginning, but managed to guide him to Zionia without ever having even stepped foot inside a city. In less than a quarter of a standard, they managed to find a port and locate a starship that was transporting goods and civilians between Earth and Frontera Zion through the wormhole. Quinn had just enough coin on him to get one passenger on board the vessel. He had kept it and cherished it as they walked past the stands of water, keeping even the child from vital nourishment, pretending he couldn't afford to pay when she would ask. When they reached the starship, he left the girl standing amazed and gaping at the vessel at the other end of the dock while he got one single ticket to Earth. Pup, he said, and knelt next to her when he got back. I have some good news and some bad news for you. She winced. Give me your hand. She did. Open it. Quinn placed the ticket in her hand and smiled at her. You're a lucky girl, pup. She did not understand at first what was happening, but before Quinn even told her that he wasn't coming with her to Earth, she started to cry. You'll be all right, he said softly. Here, take this too. Quinn gave her his tablet with all the documents certifying his deal with Zeon that would grant the custodian of the item safe passage through the wormhole, as well as a certificate for the bounty. This will get you everything you need. Don't spend it all at once. <laughs> Do you have the item? The girl nodded and showed him where she hid it. Tears were rolling down her face. Dip your toes in the ocean for me, will you? And never look back. Quinn kissed her forehead, took her hand, and brought her to her own custodian that would make sure she would be fed and cleaned once she got on board the starship. He waved goodbye and turned away. Suddenly, he felt weak and old again. His wounds and his age had finally caught up with him, but his journey wasn't over. Quinn needed to find Three's mind, steal it back from the rogues that had surely kept it, and release it from its torment, regardless of how long it took or if he would survive the ordeal at all. Three needed him one last time, and he would do anything to right the wrongs he had done. Hey, sci-fi horror fans, it's Keon. Thanks for listening tonight. If you enjoyed this story, make sure to give it a thumbs up. Craving for another scary story? Click that video on your screen. Until next time, everyone. And remember, stay cosmic.